everybody. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Chris Yee. And I'm Mike Delicio. Today we're taking a look at a game called Snow Planner, which is, I don't know if that's the best. Basically, I'm not planning snow or plan, I guess you're planning for snow. You're running a resort. You know, these cool resorts that I've never been to. You haven't been to the local one here in Florida. <laughs> yeah, well, that's one of the reasons. Um, uh, but you're running a resort, and uh, people come skiing and spend time sitting around the fire, and I don't know what else people do at these resorts because I've never been. But uh, I know there's skiing involved, and this is a game that's uh, from Japan and uh, is a worker or a dice placement game. And uh, I don't know a lot more. Mike, do you know any more about the, the, the theme or the background? Not a whole lot. I mean, just the idea is that you're basically running a ski lodge, I think, is, is basically what you're saying. And so, yeah, the idea is that uh, you are providing guest rooms. You're giving them, you know, potentially food, things along those lines, and you're allowing them to go to the slopes. So a lot of thematic uh, elements, but we'll talk about if the gameplay reflects that. All right. Well, Chris is going to show us how to play it. So here we go. Here's Snow Planner set up on the table. This is the central board here where players will be putting their dice out onto different spots and taking actions at the strength of those dice. This is the individual player board here where players are going to have guests come to stay in their hotel rooms. And these windows here represent their specialization and different skills of running a hotel, which will give them bonus income later in the game. And then these are the markets of cards that will be available. So the game of Snow Planner takes place over eight rounds. Uh, so this deck here is going to determine the game length. You'll notice here that these are the eight or the six, seven phases of the game laid out. You will first start with the announcement phase in which you will flip over one of these cards. In the first half of the game, the low season, you'll be gaining resources later in, in a later phase. But if you get to the mid season of the game, you'll notice that based on how much of a certain thing you have, you'll have to pay an upkeep cost. So in the second half of the game, you'll have to pay based on how well you are doing. Now that is just the announcement phase. Next up is the main phase where you'll be placing dice out onto the board. Every player starts with a one and a three level worker. You, know, you can take your dice in any order, come out here and get resources for your actions, or you can fire off different cards and other special abilities. And you'll go, an opponent will go, take an action, and then it uh, continues until it is your turn again, and you'll continue to take out actions. Now you notice that some of these spots here have little minuses on them. That means if you're the second or third person to go to a spot, this spot is considered weaker. So there's a few ways around that. One, you can spend tickets as a free action to strengthen your dice, so you can actually pip them up, and so that can help supersede these. Or you can pay tickets to negate the negative one effect, or snow to negate these negative two effects. So if it was my turn and something like this happened, I could come here, pay a snow, and be able to take this action at two strength still. <clears throat> so that's the dice placement phase here. You continue until all players have gone. Afterwards, you come to the resolution phase where you will resolve whatever the current round's event is. Paying resources if you have to, gaining resources in the early part of the game. After this, you come to the payment uh, phase in which you as the hotel receive payment from the guests that are staying in your room. The longer a guest will stay, the more rounds they will pay out benefits to you. Next up is the bonus phase where if you have, through your dice actions, gotten multiple of the same type of or the same color of window, based on the number of them that you have, you will be earning bonuses of different types. After the bonus phase is the checkout phase. Uh, guests will either choose to stay another night if you meet the requirements shown here. So in this case of this green guest, if you have at least one green window, they'll stay the extra night. But let's pretend that I did not have that, then at this point the guest would choose to check out instead and leave my hotel. Next up is the cleanup phase, where you'll wipe the front two cards of the market and refill, recall the dice, change the player order if necessary, and then you'd start another round from the top, revealing and continuing along as such. So let's talk about the dice placement actions and how the, the rest of the game here works. There are spots where you'll be gaining resources. Resources, as I mentioned, can be spent for different ways to upgrade your dice. You can spend croissants to get these orange windows here so that you can have specialization in orange to build up a ticket resource engine. 
Or you can come over here to this spot to get likes, where you'll move up this like track, and as you cross different benefits here, you'll get those benefits and be able to place them out, get resources, and so on. Uh, snow can be spent uh, to either uh, strengthen things, your actions, or pay for cards that require snow cost. Or if you come here with a four strength die, you can get these blue windows, which would be good for building up your snow engine. These over here, this spot is going to allow you to grab more guests who will choose to stay in your hotel. And as long as you meet their requirements, they will stay there longer. And if not, they'll check out early. This spot over here is to play out these event cards which you have in hand. Event cards might have a prerequisite shown on the left here in the red banner. You have to have at least one checked out guest. Excellent. And to play this, you must pay two snow. Fantastic. And then you'll get whatever the rewards are shown on the cards themselves. This spot over here gives you tickets. These are projects that you can spend pools of resources to earn victory points. And then this becomes a personal little worker placement spot where you can continue to earn victory points based on resources that you possess. And this will fill in. Now, halfway through the game, when you hit these high season event cards, these action spaces, which give you basic little resources, have a little token flip over so you actually get more resources. And whoever comes to the highest peak will become the first player in turn order for the next round, so on and so forth. So the game plays out like this over the eight rounds. Whoever has the most points at the end of it all, from bonuses, from cards played, from objectives that you complete, to the victory points that guests give you, including these VIPs who pay out big points, whoever has the most points at the end of the game is the winner of Snow Planner. As with a lot of these games, everything is going to be condensed into a small box. It's kind of, I'm kind of used to seeing this from Japan. I think the uh, the components are are fine. I think a lot of people are going to use the word charming to describe them with the snowy board. I, I don't think they're amazing, and because there's sometimes uh, like we got copies of English cards for all the different things in here and all, but because they're trying to condense stuff into symbols. I don't know that it always works as well as I wanted to, but I thought for the most part, it has a good look to it. And there's a, a few minor little translation things that aren't perfectly um, in like e English syntax and that type of stuff, but everything was very understandable. And so I, I like that part. And you're, and you're absolutely right, Tom. Uh, charming. Charming is the way that I would kind of describe this. The setting, the art, the components, the way that it spreads out on the table. Yeah, agreed. And and you'd asked about the background. The only thing I know is that, as you said, this is a, a Japanese game, and the they kickstarted it for English speaking audiences. And so, while actually a fair amount of the game is language dependent, and so as you said, they printed the English cards when there was text, and uh, you know tried to do symbology otherwise, but. Um, Component-wise, uh, I agree with you, Tom. I, I would say that it's it's fine, and and the look of it I really like a lot. I, I think charming is a, is a great word to, to to describe it. But I you know I get the sense that this was a smaller print run. We can actually just look at the Kickstarter and find out what the print run was likely to be. But it's not what you would consider premium components, but they're not bad either. Sure, and my favorite component, the S. It's a great font, the S, the snowman. Oh, it's, it's, just a, a, it's got the dots. That's a terrific a S. Okay. Now, and, and I don't mean this. This is <laughs> <laughs> Highlight of the game right there, folks. No, the S is great. No, make mock me all you want. The, here's the thing, though. This theme is a great theme. I love the idea of running a ski lodge. I think that's a cool theme. No pun intended. I just think it's interesting. Unfortunately, I don't think that theme bears out in any which way, any direction at all in this game, and sometimes to the point where it doesn't make any sense. Paying croissants to get a window, and then having three windows gives you this. And we were, we actually talked about this. I was talking to Chris and Wendy about this earlier, and you guys were trying to justify it. But I feel, and maybe I'm wrong, I feel like the game was designed with a different theme in mind because I, I don't see the theme at all. It's not a very thematic game. Three croissants, paying for a window, I think means that you have some quality food and you have enough of it that you have a specialization in restaurants at, that separates my ski lodge from yours. It's not strong theme, but it's enough there that, you know, you're like, you, you can kind of dig it out. And uh, 
I, I don't, I wouldn't say there's anything that's super counterintuitive, but it's not, don't come here looking for that, the theme to pop necessarily. I would say that the theme is almost solely presented through the art. Um, it's, and I don't mean this in a negative way. This, this is a Euro game through and through and the mechanics are right there in your face, right? So, um, I don't feel like I'm running a ski lodge in any sense of the, of the word, but I do like that the aesthetics are so pleasing. And, and I do agree with Chris that, that it, it didn't make it harder for me to, to learn the game or play the game because there was this huge theme disconnect. It just felt like a mechanically solid Euro with some beautiful looking art um, and, and a charming theme, but it's not a thematic game in my opinion. The, the one area where I'd say that is the guest cards as they kind of stay there for a long, you know, a day longer. You know, uh, they're like, oh, I came by, I had fun. Ooh, but you have this stuff? I'll stay for a little bit longer. You know what I mean? Like, that part is, is fun. That I agree on. That's, that, that part works, but where you guys said it doesn't affect it, I think it affects it a little sometimes in the fact that I need to remember that tickets can influence a, a die up by one and snow can make it go up by two. That makes no sense thematically, so I have a hard yeah. time forgetting it. At least the, the resources that you build the windows with are the same color. Yes. So there's that. Um, but all that being said, um, I think it is an enjoyable worker placement game. One thing that's fascinating about it, though, is the acceleration in this game is, is crazy. Like on turn, when, I, when I'm playing this turn one, I'm like, oh, man, we're not going to have enough resources to do anything. Oh, I'll turn two. Oh, we're getting there maybe a little bit. At the end of the game, you're like, ha, 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 I'm the king of everything. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm the king of the snow. And, and when, I, when you learn that, like, the first four rounds, you get a little one resource benefit, you know, from, that, from the event card. But, like, knowing that pretty soon I'm going to have to be paying stuff, oh, it feels like it's going to be so hard. But you, you grow, I think, sufficiently to, yeah. m to meet those and to actually be able to plan for those ahead of time. One of my favorite mechanisms, if you're going to have an event deck in a game... Reveal the event, resolve it after I have some time yes. to work towards it. I love that. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's a brilliant way to handle event cards, which oftentimes can feel so arbitrary, punishing, and random, um, is to give you the full action phase to be able to, uh, you know, mitigate that card or, or decide if it's worth your resources to worry about that or just take the small hit and try to go with what is more uh, important for you in the long run. So I think that's handled really well. You know, we talked about maybe the, the theme not being very strong. What I think is very strong are the mechanics of this game. I, I really think it's a rock solid dice placement game uh, that does certain things uh, a little bit differently than I've seen before. Um, I really also like the fact that your, you know, your starting character is going to give you some direction on what you might do. You're already going to be better at something than somebody else. And so that gives you a little bit of a feeling of, okay, although resources are very tight in these first couple of rounds, I know that I probably want to be focusing on this or this. Um, and, and I really feel like the game builds, as you said, Tom, to this feeling where you really are feeling like you're getting some very substantial turns. And in the last few rounds of the game, you're able to kind of like chain things and, and build you know combos and trigger this that'll let you do that. And now I've got this window and now I can do these things and now I can get a VIP. All of these things that, that kind of build. And so you feel like you're, 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 you're slowly going and then like you said, once you feel, or once you're at a certain point where you've kind of hit that tipping point, you can get a lot of things done. Um, I did want to ask you guys a question. Uh, I've played the game several times across player counts. Um, I think the only player count I have not played at is two, which I know, Chris, you have, so you can maybe speak to that. Um, did you find that turn order became most important because people wanted to take that part-time die first? That seemed to be the most popular first spot taken in almost all the games I played. I definitely took it at times, especially if I had lower dice. If I was going a strategy where I didn't necessarily want to pip up all of my dice up to four, five, and six, 
But if that shared communal die is, you know, I, I didn't mention there's the overview. There's a black die. You go to that spot, you get it. But if people level it up, the next person who takes it the next round has that at a higher level. I like that mechanism, but it definitely makes turn order important there and grabbing VIP guests before other people. Even a two-player game, there are times where I was like, I'm going first next round, and that's going to be my first action, is I want you to make sure. You first? I, I, did, huh. I did one time where I was like, this is absolutely going to be crucial to where I know I can get that thing done, and I want to be the first to get it. I think the game feels, to me, more balanced, that I don't know... There's, like, no disadvantage to getting that die, unless you're wasting a big die to get it. Um, but my, my concerns are more in, in gameplay. I'm not convinced, and I don't know that it matters, I'm not convinced all the starting abilities are balanced. I had those inklings. Now, of course, I, I haven't played this a hundred times to balance all those things out. But Sure, but I, some feel more balanced, and I'm always, I'm always worried about perception of balance anyway. Yes, and then the other one is, I don't see there's any... It feels like you need to bullet one of your dice to six as soon as possible. Because a six die is so unbelievably amazing. You know, I got so... I mean, the six dice give you so much stuff at these locations. It just feels almost insane on how good it is. Um, and then, on that note, and I'm saying a couple things, one thing. The game rules, they're not fantastic. They're okay, and they're... Mike just told us that there's like there's a Q and A. I read the the Q and A on that thing, but I found it hard to explain that you can't make a die go over the value. You're just correcting the reduction in value, and that is not a. For some reason, people are like, "Wait, why? Like you're just you can't make a four die a five, but you can make a four die that lost one back into a four. Yes, and I found that that for people is not something that's intuitive. Right. Mike, did you have something you want to speak to about turn order? Well, no, not specifically, but, but I, was, I was nodding along with Tom because the, I actually played that rule incorrectly the first time I played the game. I agree, that's not intuitive. Um, it's, it's because you, you, you have this idea of, oh, if I can just pip up a die, I can make this four a six. Well, that's not how it works. Um, it just, as you said, is a correction for those negative values. And, and that tripped me up the first time. And it's a pretty big rule that is not, I think, particularly emphasized in the rule book. It is in there 100%, but it would be nice if it was in like an important or something along those lines. And maybe it's like that in the book. I don't remember it standing out. But um, I was the, the one thing I was going to mention was about the rule book as well. Uh, I agree that that... Clearly, you can read this as a, as a native English speaker, and you can see uh, the some translation issues. I don't think there was anything in there that was uh, just completely incomprehensible. I actually thought that uh, it was quite well done, uh, for the most part, with a couple little typos and things along those lines that you might expect. Um, but I do agree about that one rule. It's, it's a bit confusing. The one complaint I think I have of the game, uh, my biggest complaint overall, is that it's it's very... Uh, Z describes games sometimes as very workmanlike. They get the job done. You place the dice, you get what you need, you get these things, you can pay for all this. Everything fl flows and works so well, but there's not necessarily moments of huge excitement for me, and I, I was hoping that those cards would kind of be that. I found that the cards were about as powerful to play out as more or less doing an action spot, right? And uh, spending a six to play out two cards feels great, but also spending a six at any other worker placement spot feels great. And so I think the cards are, are balanced and they're well done. Nothing is too bombastic about them. But the downside is nothing's too bombastic about them. I play this card out. Why? To get two croissants and a, and a like, you know, move up the track. That's more or less, you know, an, an action spot as well. So I, I was hoping, or I, I do wish that there was just a little more excitement there. Uh, I actually kind of disagree with that a little bit. I think that the cards can be very, very uh, impactful. Uh, it, it's situational, of course, but I, I have been in games. I don't particularly do very well with the cards I have found. I don't find the nice little combos. And, and uh, the, the people that I've seen play those cards, those event cards, I think they're called event cards, uh, whatever they're called, that play them well are able to really 
buff up what they're already good at, giving them some incredibly powerful turns that can be analogous to the, some of the six point die turns. Um, but it's gonna, you know, it's gonna vary depending upon, you know, which cards you see. You know, there's even in the, in the uh, rules, they say after you've played the game a couple of times, you probably wanna draft your starting hand rather than just randomly deal out six cards or five cards, whatever it is. Um, because I think they can be quite impactful. Um, and I'd say in the last couple of rounds, in most of the games I've played, you can feel the, the tension at the table because everyone is really wanting to try to get some very impactful turns those last couple of rounds, and oftentimes they are able to. So I, I do think that there's some excitement to be found there in the, in the game. Um, the, the one th other little thing that I was tripped up on it is related to those cards, which is what reminded me, is that in the rule book, when they're talking about the, some of the cards have requirements on them. Um, and it'll, it's, it shows you in the diagram, com, or requirement not to pay right underneath it. It says requirement not to pay. And then on the right side, it says cost to play. And at first I thought that meant, oh, if you've got this requirement, you don't have to pay, uh, pay to play this card. It's almost like, hey, if you've got this, like a seven wonders thing, if you've got this thing, you can play this for free. And that's not what it is. It's just basically saying, you can't even play this card if you don't have this requirement. If you do have the requirement, you can play it for these costs. So that was another little thing that I thought was uh, a little bit tricky in the rule book. Yeah, I, that I would, almost insist on playing with the drafting because I think the luck of those cards is too strong otherwise. I mean, I don't mind during the game, but at the beginning, oh, these cards have that prerequisite of playing another card. Well, then I want to have one of those cards in play. I'm giving this game a seven. I like it. I, I think it, like I said, I think it's charming and interesting. I love the dice placement. I, I'm telling you, getting a six is just a feeling of, you said excitement. That's placing a six just feels great. And I like the income that you get once you get windows of the same type out there. The VIPs and the, your starting ability and you wanting windows in certain positions, that's a little boring to me and the game isn't as good for me as it could be because I would I would like to see the theme working better. I like to be like, ooh, I decided to open a little bakery in my my thing and now I, I'm adding extra sugar in my, in my hot chocolate or whatever it is. You know, I wish it was more of that, but I think it's solid. I think it's a little, it, 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 it sidles up to being an eccentric game. Not quite, but some of the rules are a little weird, a little odd. Um, but, but it's definitely very interactive. I care about where you're going. I'm watching what other players do, and I, I, I like it to that end, so I give it a 7. And I'm coming at a 7.5. I think that it's, I think it's fun. My favorite part of it is probably that bonus phase where you get the extra resources for your windows because it really feels like that stuff is paying off. Yes. And uh, if, you can, if you can fill that up early, man, you can get a lot of stuff. But you might say, oh, I wish I had more green. Oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to play towards what I've got. I do think the cards are good. And I, 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 that's the thing. I think every part of this game is good. And I think it's a pretty safe game. I think it's kind of a safe bet that you probably will have success teaching this to people because every part of it works quite well, and I like it. So 7.5. Yeah, I, I'm coming in at 7.5 as well. You know, it, it's interesting because we did, and we do this a lot of times, and then people get, you know, a little bit up in arms. Like, you talked about all the things you didn't like and then gave it a recommendation. Well, because this is a critical review. Um, Tom is recommending it. Chris is recommending it. I'm recommending it. But we also want to make sure that people know what we like and didn't like about the game. And so what we didn't like, we've, we, I hope we've, we've mentioned, uh, you know, maybe too much in, in your opinion. You know, I felt like there were some rough edges that probably could have been shaved off with a little bit more development. But overall, I really think this is a very solid Euro game. It does a lot of things that I like. Uh, I like the fact that the, the game progresses in very clear phases, right? And one of the things I like about smartphone is that you explain, hey, here are the phases in the game. They're right on your player board. Look at those. Do we do this, then this, then this, then this, then this? Repeat until we get to the end of the fiscal year. Very easy that way to kind of make sure that everyone knows what's happening when. Chris mentioned it earlier. I think it's really smart that you get the event that you have to deal with 
in the end of the game. At the first half of the game, you get stuff, but you can plan for that. I like that a lot. I also like one of the things we didn't talk about, a major way of getting points in this game are through the, I can't remember if they're called project cards, but basically you're building up these resources. You can turn those in and you get not only a significant amount of points, but you flip that card over and now you've got a worker placement spot that only you can go to. I love that. So the game does a lot of things very well, but there are some rough edges. There are some eccentricities. It's not thematic. So those are the things that keep it from being excellent to me, but it's a very, very good game that I easily recommend, um, but with some caveats. Yeah, I forgot about those cards. Flip over. Love that. Mm -hmm. And if you give me a worker placement game that only is for me, I'm adding a point to the game. A worker placement spots that only you get to That's utilize. That's right. That's mine. Back off. <laughs> anyway, that's Snow Planner. Check it out. I'm Tom Basil. I'm Chris Yee. And I'm Mike Delisio. Stay frosty. <laughs>